Even in design school, we still tend to think of lecture courses, seminar courses, and studio courses. And I think part of what we're learning is that the studio um, environment, if equipped properly, can also be a lecture room. It can also be a seminar room. When we made the Hill proposal, it came just after we had received approval to, um, to launch an undergraduate concentration in architecture studies. And our proposal was twofold. One is that, that studio teaching was a, a good venue for undergraduate education. Uh, and second, that technology, um, some, some teaching technologies would enhance and amplify the, the, the studio experience. I, I can imagine these students who go through this studio, who learn, these, learn this software, learn this technology, learn visualization techniques. It's really about visualizing data in some right. ways. And I can imagine someone with these techniques going to graduate school in biology uh, uh, so that they can model the cell interaction. Or I can imagine uh, you know, someone uh, in an archeological study uh, animating uh, you know, a, a, an ancient site that otherwise you wouldn't be able to even imagine how that site was inhabited. I think it will enhance all those kinds of uh, professions and studies. It really takes um, a certain amount of uh, resources to really take this on. So taking account to the GSD's uh, facilities that account are digital fabrication, um, a lot of the things that these machines can actually do is essentially an extension of our potential to really begin to visualize how design practice and how design can actually begin to evolve um, is something that is exemplative of these exercises the students went through. What we see here is an example of surface, frame, and volume, and how each of those iterations begin to talk about uh, formalizing certain design strategies. Essentially, each of these models are prototypes. Um, you can see them as models that are, they don't, they don't have an exemplative scale. We don't look at them like this is a building, per se, or this is a room. With the technology at hand, we can really begin to expand different scales. So we can look at this as something that we hold in our hands to something that is actually the, the entire room. And yeah, or a landscape. That, that space actually yeah. quite, it does it quite well. The studio environment is, is inherently collaborative um, as, as well as innovative. It was extraordinary to come up and see Zanetta's group sort of uh, all, all around a very, very large table working, uh, you know, with cutters and, uh, uh, and, and paper and, and plastics. It definitely enhances all of the sensories so that it's not only the making of this, but it's also the visualizing. So having the exposure of, you know, actually making a model, a physical model in front of you to everything uh, all the graphics and sort of the, the 2Ds, the plasma screens, the projectors, these are all means of how we can actually begin to visualize and communicate our ideas. Not just through the collaboration of the students and the instructor, but it's also communication that happens between ourselves, um, to outside disciplines, to our audience. So we're trying to communicate very complex, fairly abstract ideas into a manner that's actually quite clear and hopefully something that begins to resemble what we actually see in the outside world. I think I would consider the studio successful if, if when the students leave, they see their environment in a more articulate, um, legible way. They know how to read a text, they probably know how to look at a movie, but they might not know how to read a city or how to, or how to uh, make a landscape legible. So and I think having a critical eye to... Having a critical sure. eye, having a critical eye, exactly. There was one woman at the end um, one of the students, and she said, I came here knowing I could think, um, but I didn't know that I could make, and I didn't know that I could think by making. I mean, that's what, that's what we want. Yeah.